Hi, this is Jaro Stark, and you're about to hear a really special interview with a friend of mine named Anthony Putty. Now, Anthony is a person who runs a support service for budding authors, so people who want to get their book published, whether it's fiction or nonfiction or, or how to, or any kind of book you're looking to self publish or even go down the traditional route. Anthony knows everything about publishing. So I'm actually about to start the process of getting a book ready for myself to publish and I naturally got in touch with Anthony to get some help and wow did he have an amazing amount of knowledge about this subject. So naturally I invited him to come onto my podcast and share his story. So if you're interested in getting your own book published and why it could be used as a fantastic tool for your business, in particular if you're a blogger who wants to use a book and perhaps some of the content in your blog as part of the content of the book and how all that works together, this is definitely a podcast you want to listen to and obviously keep track of my own progress, which I'll no doubt be writing about on EJ with the publishing of my book. Now, before Anthony begins with this interview, I'd just like to tell you that my EJ Insider program is currently open and available for you to become a member of. It is my interviews club. So if you like this interview with Anthony and you want more amazing interviews with million dollar bloggers and people who have made a lot of money as online entrepreneurs, whether they've built information publishing businesses or they do email marketing or they have software as a service business, you're going to hear interviews with very successful people who do this sort of thing online inside the EJ Insider program. It's a great course. I've already had the first group of members begin the program and they're really giving me some amazing feedback. So if you love interviews, you love interviews from me. I'm the person who did all the interviews inside the EJ Insider program and you want a huge back catalog of all my previous interviews as well. It's all inside the EJ Insider. So just go to www.ejinsider.com forward slash interviews and you will see all the interviews I have available there. I hope you enjoy the program. Here's Anthony. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon. Hello, this is Yara Stark, and welcome to an Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. We have a really fun topic with my guest today. His name is Anthony Puddy, and he's actually a friend of mine from Brisbane, and we've been friends for a long time. We actually met rollerblading at part of a rollerblading club. I think, uh, Anthony, you're by far the only guest I could ever say that about. <laughs> so uh, there's a claim to fame already. Uh, but the reason why I brought Anthony on board to talk on the podcast today is he has a tremendous amount of experience with book publishing, and in particular, helping other people uh, get published. And it's obviously a, a really interesting industry with all the transitions happening with Kindle and people becoming independent publishers rather than going the traditional route of doing a, you know, a big publishing firm and then that old model falling apart. So we're going to talk today about book publishing and why you want to do it and how people are doing it and how people make money from publishing books and what Anthony does. But just a brief introduction to Anthony before we talk about that. So when I met Anthony, he was actually doing design work for video games. And he's also done some design work for uh, TV. That eventually led to uh, illustrating some uh, young adult books, which he's been a part of, which was kind of like your gateway, wasn't it, Anthony, to, uh, to book publishing, because you got to experience what it's like to have your own book published while you were the illustrator for it. That's, That's correct? That's right. Yeah. Yep. And, and that then led to starting what you do currently, which is uh, bookcovercafe.com, which is a, a kind of an all-in-one service for people who want to get published. And you've helped over 50 books get out there in all kinds of areas from kids to self-help to uh, nonfiction business and so forth. So, And I've been talking to Anthony just before we started this interview because I'm looking to get my own book published uh, next year. And I'm beginning the process now. And he's filling me in on a lot of information. I actually told him he has to shut up because we need to record this on the interview for you guys to hear as well. So <laughs> Anthony has a ton of knowledge in this area. So if you've ever been interested in getting your book published and why you'd want to do that and how it can help your business or make you become a published author or make money, this is the interview to listen to. So, Anthony, thank you for coming on this call. Oh, thank you, Yara, for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to chat. So, uh, a little bit of background first about yourself. Can you tell us, uh, you know, how did you get into the whole world of book publishing? Maybe break down a bit more than, than the introduction I gave you. Sure, sure, yeah. Well, like everyone, I started out working in um, a typical nine-to-five job. 
But I was actually doing something I was enjoying, which was working in the entertainment industry. So I, I actually started out in television doing commercials and um, TV shows and uh, doing a lot of corporate video. And before me, moving into doing um, next-gen video game development, which was PlayStation 3 and, and Xbox. So these were really big, multi-million dollar uh, budget titles. So over um, the course of probably, uh, it must have been about uh, eight or nine years, I was um, working as a design and, and animator. And so I was working on a lot of the production development and also um, became very interested in, and um, really enjoyed the aspect of liaising with um, the marketing side of things. And um, so it was while I was there that um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Kev, who has his, who's been writing his, um, his books, uh, he was uh, looking to get published. So over the years while I was at the day job, I'd been to uni before, the, the, um, before working in the entertainment industry. I'd done the school thing and the uni thing like most people do. And um, I knew Kev was writing this particular book, and he's a, a close friend of mine of many years. And so he needed some illustrations. So I was happy to do some illustrations over that, over that time because I did a lot of design and, um, and drawing. And so when the time came to actually uh, publish his book, he'd had a meeting with a particular publisher – and um, he wasn't – obviously, it was very new territory for him. So I came in and lent some of my, uh, my production experience and how to actually deal with, uh, with uh, publishers in a different sense. But you're still dealing with um, those people that actually um, you know, decide on what the product needs to be before it's released to the market. So that's regardless if it's a TV show or it's a commercial or it's a, it's a book. A lot, there's a lot of similarities there. Mm-hmm. So my experience um, lent across very well. So – um, yeah, so when the time came to actually um, go through the publishing process uh, for Kev, it was about, um, I think it'd be about, geez, be about six years ago, I think now it is. Um, I started helping him publish with his publisher, going through the, the contract agreement and, and whatnot. And um, going through that process, uh, he actually went through a subsidy publisher, which is where you actually sort of pay to get your book published. And this is not something I, uh, I advocate today, but for him it was, a, it was something very new and he thought it was the right thing for him to do. And so this is where I really got my feet wet um, in, the, um, in the industry of publishing. And so um, started helping him go through that process, uh, learn what to do. I actually worked with a lot of the different um, professionals that were involved, cover designers, editors, and um, and working and liaison with the distributors. And so from there, that led me into researching and finding out a lot more ways about publishing your book and the pros and cons to trade publishing to self-publishing. Because I learned a lot through that particular process of dealing with them, and there was a lot I did like and a lot I, I didn't like, and I can get to that a bit later. So... Uh, from there, I started doing a lot more uh, consulting with other authors based on a lot of the experience that I had actually um, worked with Kev, working with others. And from what I had actually been teaching myself, I had done continued to do a lot more liaison with other industry professionals and helping them, uh, those actually focusing on the independent market um, and helping them with their, with their clients. So doing a lot of consulting. And this is still after hours from still being at the, um, at the day job at the mm. time. So... I was helping a lot of them um, so navigate the publishing ocean, uh, ocean helping them actually avoid uh, scrup- uh, unscrupulous, I think the word I, am, I meant to say, these vanity publishers that charge overinflated prices and helping them actually go about publishing it, uh, publishing their books um, in different ways. So Amazon was just coming into its own, um, and there was other publishing um, businesses that um, were actually a little bit more legitimate and fair to the authors. Mm. So this was before the whole print-on-demand thing really skyrocketed. We'll get to that soon. Um, So I was doing consulting um, for uh, a few years after hours and on weekends from the day job um, and uh, helping people that way. Um, And then I uh, it was uh, just a a few years ago, it would be nearly three years ago, um, I sort of thought, you know, I've got to um, I've got to reach out and uh, and do something more here. I need to reach more people. This one-on-one consulting is not enough, and there's a I'm, there's a lot of people out there that are struggling with this on how to get to their books to market. Um, you know, the best ways of doing it. So I thought um, I need to create something bigger than myself, and so that's where I decided to uh, create Book Cover Cafe. And at that point, I had some money saved up in the bank. And, and may decide to make the jump into creating my own business and transforming that consulting into doing a, a full-fledged business 
and that essentially author, writers and authors can get to come to and trust that we're going to put them on the right path to publishing. So, and, uh, and for the last uh, few years, we've um, won a, a couple of awards for our services and the advice that we do. And so now uh, Book Cover Cafe is uh, also is a, a, essentially a service vendor, as you mentioned, taking, helping people go from Word doc to the sh store shelf, whether that be online or offline. And, and so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. <laughs> Fantastic. I love that phrase from Word doc to store shelf because that is the journey for a writer to you know get published so and there's obviously a lot of steps in between that and a lot of questions that need to be answered which i'd love to do now but uh, anthony just just a little brief stop though on your own entrepreneurial experience here you quit your job to start book cover cafe yep that's right like, you said you had some savings so did you have a year worth of money that you could rely no, on I, or well let me, uh, it was um i think it was about I think it was about eight months or so worth. And it was short. It was short of a year. And did you have any actual income from this business at that stage? Just consulting income? Or? It was just the consulting gigs at that point that I was trying to blow out. Yeah. Okay. Um, at that point, I was also um, probably for that last twelve months before leaving my job, I was actually um, doing a lot of a lot more cover design work as well, um, as well as helping people sort of uh, point them in the right direction, mm -hmm. teeing them up with editors that were trustworthy and that kind of thing. Okay. So I wasn't actually. Uh, doing a lot of the ser other services myself at that point, just covers and just doing the consulting. And then um, with about seven or eight months probably in the bank, and that's where I decided to create the business and sort of make it more of a full-fledged mm. entity, if you I, like. I can imagine you know, doing covers is a fairly straightforward design-type role, which is what your background was, so that's fantastic. Right. And then the consulting is where all the questions can come where like how do I get my book into Barnes and Noble and how do I get my book in Kindle and who actually prints my book and do I ha you know how much do I make per book sale and all those sorts of questions yep, would come up right. and you're you're kind of answering them and, and on a consulting per hour kind of basis is that's that it. pretty much it and how, how are right. people finding you just word of mouth they it was most of it was word of mouth because I, I didn't have a whole lot of time to do any sort of marketing. And um, it was all word of mouth through other people and colleagues because they just really enjoyed working with me and their experience was just a really positive one. And um, they'd end up getting the results that they liked. And so, of course, they told someone else that wanted to do something similar or thought it was a good idea and they put me on, they put them on to me. And, and, um, and I started to really see that um, just as a, as a, a business owner of one, like as a consultant or a contractor, um, the biggest thing people wanted was just someone to actually take an interest in them and care. And so that's what I did. I evaluate what their sort of goals were. If they just wanted to print out just a few books for the family, then, you know, doing this whole big publishing, you know, creating your own publishing name and everything is going to probably be a bit overkill for you. You're better off sort of doing this. Um, or someone else wanting to dominate the world, well, you know what, you want to go down this path. And really providing a lot of the clarity there and, and getting to know quite a few of the different vendors around and, and other contractors who are able to do the editing and the, and the typesetting and, and actually do the distribution stuff and point them in the right direction of other trusted people that I uh, either come to know or that have done the right thing by other authors. And that's, so that's basically what my consulting um, entailed. Yeah, and it sounds like it's a great way to kind of learn about the marketplace, sort of have an open-ending consulting service and then yeah, start to narrow it down, which exactly. leads me to a very obvious question. What did most people want and, and what were they most struggling with like in terms of their, their gap of knowledge? Well, it, um, it probably, it's a, probably a broad range. I would say it's actually it's, the, it's trying to close the gap of this big hole they have in their mind. It's this, how do I, I have a Word doc sitting me on, front, on my laptop here. How is it that that gets to the bookstore? And that was the single biggest question, um, trying to do that. And, it was just, and that's where the Word doc to bookstore <laughs> shelf came into it because and I would go about just mapping out the steps that has to happen before then. Okay. Um, it was also when does the editing take place? Does it happen before or after the cover design, the typesetting, and that kind of thing? Um, so back, uh, back then, the old Kindle hadn't exploded like it is today, so a lot of that was still majority was print. Mm. And distribution was a big thing. How do I get into stores and get, um, get into um, distribution? How many books do I need? Is there another alternative? That kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, well, that was, they were the big questions. I'd love to answer some of these questions. So can you take us on a bit of a journey here? There's two models, sounds like, 
well, this is what you told me from my own book. There's two models that I can pursue. There's the traditional book publishing route where I have the, the publishing company handle it. And that's some, like you said, it was going to be a two year process potentially that I'm not really in control of. And then the more self publishing route where I have a lot more control. I think most people are familiar nowadays that there's those two paths where yeah. you know a, a big company takes you on they might pay you in advance to write the book but they're going to take most of the sales that like you only yeah. get cents in the in the dollar in terms yeah. of your share of the revenue so can you just tell us in a nutshell not too long the old model or the, the publishing model and you know what's what is still available in that model sure um so you've got the traditional route. Um, so people are either self-publishing or they're traditionally publishing. Now, before the age of eBooks and and Amazon and and crushing it on Kindle and print on demand, uh, if you were to go about publishing the book yourself outside of the trade, you really had to go about um, getting uh, go with offset printing, where you would print a whole stack of copies and usually have to do it in some sort of volume in order to get a reasonable price on your print per copy to make it viable. So you would have to go about, say, printing at least, say, 1,000, 2,000 copies of a book. Um, you'd have to pay for that up front, so you would have to allow for that capital. And that's on top of your book production costs, like your copy editing and your cover design and whatnot. And so once you had those copies, you needed to make sure that you had a distributor, a, a physical real-world distributor that would have had um, a couple of reps that were the, those who liaison with the bookstores and, and, and other retailers to actually order books. And so you go on a catalog, a distributor's catalog, and there, you they are able to then mark, like sort of make your books available to other stores and retailers. And hopefully, if they're a distributor with you know that's worth their salt, they would actually um, talk about your book and, and and pitch your book to retailers. Um, and so they needed a, a supply there of, of book stock that they could actually provide to those retailers once they'd actually decided to buy from them. Okay, so that was the model uh, that was. Uh, probably the most common way of going about self-publishing before print-on-demand came along, which has been a, a godsend to independent publishers, both publishers and authors, that is, and because it was very uh, expense-heavy. There was a lot of uh, lot more risk sort of up front without really guaranteeing, you know, if, if your distributor did the wrong thing by you or they folded um, or they didn't have their uh, reps doing what they needed to do or they weren't really holding up their bargain as a distributor needs to, then you're stuck with a lot of books that you have to move. So um, you know, the, the barrier to entry was a lot higher for people mm -hmm. than what it is today. Okay. Um, and before you explain today's options, sure. can we just tie this into the listener? Because everyone has heard that sort of phrase, unless you're – a J.K. Rowling, you're not yeah. going to make money selling print books. And it's kind of ironic. I, I think about this a lot that because uh, I've sold digital product for a long time and, you know, never gone down traditional yeah. publishing or anything like that kind of path. But I can sell an ebook for, you know, 40 to $50 that's all digital and keep, you know, all that money unless there's affiliates where a person who goes and writes a much bigger book and gets it printed and an actual paper book, which means the cost of production is higher, can charge 20 bucks for it, which is less. Yeah. And then they have to share a big chunk of it with uh, you know, the distributors and the, the bookstores and all that. So it, it always seemed to me like that old model is crazy and the, and the positioning point is, is silly. Why would you want to get a book when you can just you know, write smaller ebooks and charge more for them and have them digital and sell them yourself? And yeah. obviously, there's also that other point of view that people are well aware of is that okay print books don't make money but they do build brands and they give you exposure and it is a credibility being a published author which can spread itself over to your other businesses and, and you know help you to sell whatever else you do whether it's consulting or speaking or something like that so can you kind of tell us how do you get rich with a being a published author nowadays <laughs> <laughs> well those you, you you make you bring up a very good point um, the thing with them, the, the print books and why you'd still do a print book is one for credibility. If you already have a big online, um, a, a brand, you're building up a great platform and you can have the choice of selling products direct and actually charging more for them. What, what you don't get there is the, the extra eyes and reach. You don't get the extra reach out into the public. 
um, for bringing for, for having new people just uh, find discover you and and buy something from you, opening their wallet for something that you have to offer. And so for print books, um, a lot uh, a lot of the money can be made on the back end because they serve as a lead generator. And this is particularly um, relevant to bloggers and those nonfiction authors who are doing the speaking speaking circuit or have a small or a medium business and so the print book print's been around for centuries and everyone knows what a print book is you don't have to sell anyone on the idea of that as an actual product in itself they know how a print book works they know how they can digest it and consume it and they have an idea of its value as as well and so i think that's where a lot of your credibility starts is that um anyone if you have a print book it has a, a higher perceived value than just some digital ebook or a PDF you read on your computer. It's something tangible. It's in their hand. They can take it with them. They can smell the paper, and there's an inherent um, higher perceived value that goes with the print book. And it it's still very much is the case today as well. Even though we're in a time of Amazon and Kindle and ebooks, having a print book its place. And will continue to live on in the future, I believe, because it has that different air of, of credibility about it. Mm-hmm. And the tangibility. And, yeah, and tangibility, that's right. So it's the I think Kindle. it's more on a um sorry uh, on a, a sort of volume basis that you can actually make some uh, money off your print books if you actually print and distribute economically. Mm-hmm. So okay, uh now we know that JK Rowling is like the richest woman in the UK and is that because she sold so many books, even though she only makes a dollar per book in royalties, if you sell you know, 100 million books, then she's made $100 million. Is that pretty much how she got rich? Well, J.K. Rowling got rich because she, um, she started with print books and she started in, in, um, in the UK first. So in the UK, the, the book had to spend 12, 18 months and actually travel the school circuits in the, in the schoolyards. And it built up a lot of word of mouth there. And, and of course, with, just with Bloomsbury there in the UK, she was published with them for um, a couple of years, if I'm not mistaken. And that was before, I think it was HarperCollins uh, from the US came and said, hey, we'd like to buy the rights to the US. And that all happened over a period of years. That didn't all happen overnight. Mm-hmm. And what I also um, rec- uh, say to people is that, okay, you, you don't want to sort of emulate what J.K. Rowling has now because she started publishing 20 years ago. You need to be doing what J.K. Rowling would have to do if she started today. Which is? And, well, <laughs> if it was, she was starting today, she would need to uh, reach out to her or even start building up a bit of a name for herself. And so that's where this term platform comes in for those authors um, who aren't sort of bloggers and in the blogosphere per se, but um, other authors that are perhaps coming offline into the online space. They want to build up a bit of platform. They want to start building their readership or their uh, thousand true fans. And they really want to start there, you know, start just smaller, building up that tribe that know and just loves your work. So this is whether you're a fiction book or a fiction author or a, a nonfiction author. And it's a low barrier to entry and it's something that you can start right away even if your book is still 18 months out from being ready, if you still plan to do one. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if uh, for any fiction author, that's where I would recommend that they start. It went, then create um, – for fiction – it's different to nonfiction. So with nonfiction, it can serve as a, a lead generator. It can serve as a, a really great credible calling card for many different aspects of your professional um, uh, platform. For fiction authors, um, it doesn't necessarily work the same way because it's entertainment. It's not a problem-solving device, tool, product. So people approach it as entertainment. It's something they would like to do in the spare time that they actually have. For fictional, uh, for readers, they're very... Uh, they go through books like you wouldn't believe. And for a fiction author, the the, the money lies in having a back catalogue. It relies in having a, you know, half a dozen books that are on the market because each book acts as a, a gateway to the next book. So if someone finds one of your books you know, on an actual store shelf, they really love it, and it's going to be more convenient for them at midnight when they've just finished your first book and they can't wait to buy your second one. So they go online to Amazon and they buy it. Mm. They like the idea they can actually stay and keep consuming your content. So for fiction authors, the money is in the list, and that's the backlist of books. Yeah, that's interesting. So the product funnel for a fiction author is the other books they've written. Where for it's it. very much right. That's it, right. It, it's interesting because, like, for me or another blogger slash information marketer, we might have a series of products from audio CDs to live events and yep. recorded webinars and all these different types of media that we essentially hope people will want to buy. But for an author, it's just 
here's the next chapter in in the series I've written for a fiction author. Yeah. yeah. So the um, the nonfiction author is more like the the Michael Port model, where he's got it's all senses around your book, book yourself subtle. But he's also got an online course, and he's got an audio book, and he's got like a picture version of it, and it's all centered around basically around the one book. Not not a volume of books, and so that's how he's able to build out his much bigger business around that book, and that's what he's able to lead to. That's his that's his choice. You can do that. You've got plenty of options. So the the point about going about uh, publishing the way I advocate is it gives you the those options, and it gives you the flexibility to okay. support whatever goals that they, that you have. So let's take me as an example. You know, I, I'm not a fiction writer, and I, I don't want to focus on the fiction writing. Let's focus on the nonfiction okay. as a platform as well. Sure. I'm going to write a book, or I've got a book coming out, and it's obviously going to be about my area, which is blogging, and, and it's meant to be an exposure tool, a credibility tool, and get more exposure for what I do and what I teach and, and bring people back to the products that I sell online, yep. obviously. But what's the possibility of me actually making a ton of money from the book itself? Uh, it's, it's going to happen uh, on volume. So... And also that you keep your print costs down and you keep your retail price high, okay? So it's a, a simple profit and loss. So doing the old way of self publishing where you needed a distributor or a wholesaler, then the retailer, all these people uh, are going to be taking a cut. And by the time you actually get it, you know, you've got a, a couple of dollars to your name. So in order to you know, <laughs> become rich through selling books, you've got to rely on a lot of volume to what, do that. How many? How, what, like what do you have to sell? Uh, well, it depends on how much you is what you want to make. That could be a moving target. How, how, how many books do I have to sell to make a million dollars? A million dollars? Well, if you're selling you know, your book for – if you're making $2 for every you know, $10 book you're selling, well, you'd need you know, 500,000 copies to make a million bucks. <laughs> that's, that's, that's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So it's more likely to – like for the average human being, it's a much more respectable goal to think, okay, let's get – this book is a gateway to publicity to get me onto TV shows, to get me onto radio, to get me into magazines and newspapers and, and other websites online as well, as well as getting me into Amazon. So there's new distribution channels. And then yeah. in that book, I'm, I'm building my name, I'm building my brand. And obviously I'm saying at some point in the book, I'll, I'll have a, a reference back to my website, join my newsletter, and then they're going to start getting all my other products for sale. And that's more likely. It's It's just a nice big lead generation tool oh, yes. for my business. Oh, yes, because you're getting a reach into a whole new audience and where these audiences are hanging out, you know, because a lot of people might not know, you know, Yara and his entrepreneurial journey blog. But, um, you yeah, know, they might be re perhaps reading other blogs or they look in the tech section or the newspaper or something like that. And through there and seeing your book available, they're going to discover you. And and that can happen on a, on a much um, a broader scale, of mm. course, too. Um, and so... The, the print-on-demand online, the Amazon model, allows you to start creating a funnel that can actually be more automated so you are selling more copies sort of on autopilot. And so there's things that you need to do. This is what, part of what we do at Book Cover Cafe is helping authors make sure they set up and make sure their book is available correctly so they can actually then increase their chance of success in actually making residual sales from your books. So it might not necessarily is it about volume and becoming a millionaire just from your books itself. Um, you know, fiction authors never become millionaires, as I said, on from one book. It's going to be from the backlist and the catalog. So um, what you can do with online retail, including Amazon and Barnes and Noble, is that um, providing your book, you know, you get a decent ranking and you drive your sales there. Somewhere, somewhere like Amazon, which is why a lot of people focus on it, is Amazon has its own internal algorithms that uh, along with reviews and you know selling books, you can rank up in your specified category. And so once you've actually got your book ranking goes up and up, it moves into the higher categories where you become more visible and more people can discover you and sort of and buy you just when they're browsing catalog um, the different categories, um, or they can perhaps just buy you on impulse. And you also get um, uh, categorized with other books, and you get on. And Amazon has about half a dozen lists from top rated, best selling recommended and the top 100 they've got quite a few lists and your book can move from one to another based on its performance and this all happens on autopilot so rather than actually thinking in volume you can actually think that you, it's a great way just to have residual sales however many that is okay it's funny to think about this because there's a lot of other things we can do to market ourselves and having a book there's a bit more magic to that, I think, because of the, the history of, of 
that kind of dream of being a published author. Yeah. And, and the yeah. barriers have dropped to, to doing that. So there's more published authors now, no doubt, than there have been in the past, since it's so much easier to, to print on demand and, and so forth. Uh, but it, it's kind of funny because because the barriers are dropping, it's sort of now needs to be thrown into the mix of all other possible lead generation things we can do, like, yeah. uh, you know, just write a report or, or create uh, a series of, you know, audios and, and release them through a podcast or, you know, these choices you can make. But it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you are a person who's already publishing content, why wouldn't you figure out what type of that content can be packaged up into a book and use that channel because it sounds like a lot of it happens automatically once the book is set up and we we need to break down this process Anthony we should do that next but sure. it sounds like kind of the way my blog can potentially get picked up in search results and I can bring you people who just happen to be searching for something you know, obscure that I've written about the book can appear on a bookshelf somewhere in the world where I don't know it's been bought, but a, a, a book catalog had my, my book in there and the person who's responsible for, for bringing in books to that bookshop said, you know what, let's, let's try it on our shelves, see how it goes. It looks interesting. And I could be selling in you know, Timbuktu in Africa without even knowing Check. it kind of thing, which is cool. <laughs> and, and it, it is cool. And that person might not have otherwise discovered you otherwise. You know, um, so they might. That's what I was saying before. If those people aren't uh, those hungry um, technophiles that are online, you know, um, you know, five, six, seven hours of the day, they're probably going to be have other channels that they actually discover and and, and consume their content. So bookstores is going to perhaps be would be one of those. Um, there's few around, but if you can find a bookstore, then that's probably going to be um, one channel for them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and and oh, so. It's uh, it really is about getting out to an audience that otherwise perhaps wouldn't have discovered you. Um, there are those uh, exceptions to the rule where you have Amazon. If you have a book on Amazon, because Amazon is, has an incredibly high page rank, it's a, um, a ridiculously huge authority in Google's eyes. Um, there's a lot of people that actually have their book listings, particularly with Kindle books, list them on Amazon and do some SEO and actually get their Amazon book rank to rank for a particular keyword in Google. And so you probably, if you're starting with a very new website, it's not going to have much authority or page rank. So your ability to actually come up in search results is probably going to take a lot more time than it would for an Amazon listing that already has the weight and authority to actually appear in a search result for a keyword. Mm. And a lot of people do that as well. And so Amazon already has that credibility. They go there. The sales page is already there. The fulfillment and the printing and the purchasing is already taken care of for you, and you just wait for the dollars to drop into your dashboard. Yeah, interesting. I, I, it sounds like, and, and your clients might be a representation of this, Anthony, but that people come to you who haven't got any platform online. They haven't got a blog or a podcast or even a, a, a Facebook channel with many followers or friends that they think, you know what, I've got this book, let's publish it, and that can be my first step in the platform building process, and they, they build out from there. It's kind of like the opposite direction from what, what I'm looking to do. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, most of them do, because then retailers and bookstores um, and, and places like Amazon Online do allow um, the ability for people who don't have any of that credibility or platform yet to reach out to readers that are browsing or shopping on these stores. And it does give them the ability to say, hey, I'm available on all these different places. And being available on Amazon and in Barnes & Noble and being able to have your book appear in you know, your local library and stuff, that starts giving you some credibility in the eyes of your readers. You might not have been on this TV show or appeared in this particular paper yet or have a, a huge list of, of, of you know, 10, 20,000 people. But if your book is available in these different channels that just the average general Joe respects and considers as, hey, that, that's, that's a fairly big deal, and they probably think of it on more of a subliminal level, then that's going to lend you a bit of credibility. Um, you're probably your first uh, bit of credibility um, as you're building a platform up. So that can actually help people quite a bit. And I know it certainly has helped quite a few of the, the fiction and children's book authors mm -hmm. um, that have made their way into schools and libraries and, uh, and newspapers and events and, and even radio um, because they started with the credibility of that availability of their book. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, let's let's bring this back to probably the more likely listener to this interview, which is the blogger or the information marketer who wants to get the book out there to to basically get more customers, get more leads into into their funnel in whatever way, shape, or form, reach new audiences. Now, yeah. I'm a good example because that's what I want to do with, with my book and have the credibility of being a published author. To do that, I've already started the process of contacting Anthony here, and I've also contacted a friend as a potential ghost writer. Now, she's not going to write the entire book, so to speak, but I'm giving her my content because I've already produced courses and blog articles and, and reports, so I can bring together those things as well as interviews I've done and say, this is what I want in the book. Can you weave it together? So there'll be a, a heavy editing process rather than ghostwriting from scratch that this person will do. And then I will have phase one of what Anthony calls from Word doc to, to store shelf. So I'll have Word doc ready yep. to go. Can you take us forward, Anthony, with what happens next with Word doc? Okay, so once you've got your Word doc and you've got it into a structure, so there's subheadings and headings and, and whatnot, whether you're doing it or, in this case, a, a ghostwriter, then that Word doc um, then needs to go through, have a, what's done is your book production process. So that's where that begins. The book production process includes your copy editing, it includes your book cover design typesetting, and if you're adding ebook into the mix, it would be your ebook formatting as well. And so before the typesetting and the formatting can happen, you've got to get it uh, copy edited. So you might have a, a structure in place, you'd have your subheads, um, you might have your table of contents and whatnot, but an editor needs to now go through and double check um, a lot of the punctuation, um, spelling errors, uh, context, uh, what sort of English do you want it written in? That's something that um, a lot of authors and writers don't consider. Do they want it in UK English, uh, US English, or, or Australian English? Um, and so a good editor will help it consistent, wh whichever one that you want to use. So if you're really um, going to be targeting the US market, um, then go with a, like a US English. So uh, often it's perhaps a personal preference. For example, children's book authors that are very much focused nationally will perhaps will stick with the English that is native to that country that they're doing. So that is something to consider. An editor will help you do that. The editor will also um, check any references as well. Um, they'll help you with creating an index if you actually need one, and they'll help you with the actual ordering and logic and structure flow of your actual book. And they'll put things out that you, as an author, you would never see because you're just too close to your to your work. So. The first thing that can happen is you can, once you've got your Word doc completed, um, you'd probably go through some, uh, the book would go into the editing process, then you could start your cover design. So your cover design is going to be your first point of, um, of, of your marketing, okay? So it's arguably the most important part of your marketing because it's used in all the, the marketing that you'll be doing, both online and offline. And it's also the first impression that is made to Amazon and online. So your cover is seen as a thumbnail on Amazon, so it leads to that first impression. So you've got to have a really good cover and have a really good title, something that captures people's attention. And the cover is your first point where you've got to look credible, look like it's a professional job, look like that you're worth taking notice of and that you didn't just upload um, some sort of uh, dodgy Kindle book to sort of the Amazon store and you took no time to do it. We're not doing that. We're creating um, a professional, uh, credible, quality lead generator, quality product that we can comfortably and confidently approach to any PR, publicists, and newspapers, stores. They're going to look at it and go, yeah, this looks like the real deal. Um, let's do business mm -hmm. or yeah, we're happy to hear from you. So you've got to create a product that is worth talking about. You, I, I think Seth Godin lends to this, the idea of being remarkable. So you've got to create a product that is remarkable, something that is going to be able to be the cream that rises to the top. And part of that is having a great message to start with, which someone like yourself, you obviously do Yaro, and then you would go into creating the product so it also is packaging your, mes your message um, really professionally and a really of a high quality. And so... Your cover design starts, you go a bit of back and forth with your cover designer. Um, we actually include uh, your print, your ebook, and your bonus promo images that you can stick in your um, all your online or marketing efforts as well. Um, so your cover design can probably take between a, a week or two and a lot of back and forth between the author and the cover designer. It's a very hands-on process, a very um, uh, a much 
very collaborative process. Editing probably takes between about three to four weeks for that first draft edit, um, and the editor works with you directly to to fine tune the manuscript, making sure it structurally and reads well from the reader's point of view. But it's also um, your your message remains intact and it has a logical flow. So from there, you're moving into typesetting, which is the actual print layout of your book. So that's where your words, your Word doc, uh, come and meet on an actual layout program where it's formatted to a certain book size. And this is where it's important to decide what sort of size book that you want. So you might have a, a small 8 by 5 inch book or you might have a traditional standard trade paperback book. Um, so for fiction authors, they might have a different decision um, to make between their sizes. And nonfiction, the 6 by 9 inch uh, trade size is a very popular choice, particularly for books between two and 300 words. Um, it makes it a little bit easier to open up and read and yet the spine still looks pretty thick. So it looks like you're – it feels like a good – thud book, you know, like you can drop it on the table. It feels like it's very substantial. So that's something that um, people have to consider as well. And um, and then there's, of course, ebook formatting where your print book is then converted into an ebook format, hoping to keep its layout and the, the integrity as close to the original print uh, reading experience as possible. And um, it goes from there. Okay, so that sounds like we now have the tools to actually get the book produced both digitally and physically. That's right, yeah. Okay. So there's there's the one step where I don't know if you want to go through this now, Yara, which is um, the way I advocate, which is the print on demand and having your own little publishing mm. name because there's an extra step just in between those two things. Okay, let's talk about that, but just one quick question on okay. book covers first because sure. I see the cover kind of like the title on a blog post. The title on the blog post is more important than the content on the blog post right. in a lot of ways. Uh, it's that first impression, it's the hook, it's the angle, it's and in the case with the cover, you got graphics and color and there's a lot of things to it. What, what, is there a science with book covers like that, you know, because I'm, I see book covers change over the years too. People, you know, you have yeah. the same book, but new covers. With different uh, editions, they might have a, yeah. um, yeah, so, a separate cover. And different covers for different countries and things like that. So there's obviously a really big science behind this. I'm sure there's people who just specialize in cover design, especially in, you know, the big top books like, you know, J.K. Rowling's publishers must go, which cover do we want for which country and, and that level of detail. Am I right sure. with that? Yeah, well, J.K. Rowling is probably an exception because those, those publishers are probably happy to spend anything they want on a brand that is, um, you know, so well known throughout the world. So they, um, they might. I know they're going through a rebranding process of updating the covers as we speak, and you can see the different covers they're doing for books one, two, and three in the Harry Potter series. Yeah. They're probably just giving a quick facelift for them. It's not going to cost much, and considering it's just a ridiculously big brand, and they'll probably do that on the face if they know that there's going to be something bigger coming out. So. Um, so, uh, with what about for authors, me? Oh, sorry. What about yeah, for you? me though? If I want to do a cover, and I because I yeah. know I want to make sure that it it really works. So, you, um, you want to start on the title, as you said. So, the example that you gave between a blog post title and a book cover is is quite true. It is is it is really spot on. So, with a book cover, you want to be focusing on the title as, uh, as well. You, uh, the title is just as important um, as it is for a blog post as it is for a book. You want something that is a blend between what conveys. The, the message and the benefit to the reader and also something that um, is intriguing and also represents the brand of the person who is publishing the book. So if you have a small or medium business, then you might have something in the title that is representative of that without perhaps being too specific. So there's quite a lot of um, brainstorming and back and forth um, with coming up a really good title. You, of course, have a, a subtitle which allows you to get in a few more uh, of the benefits on what readers can actually expect on the inside. Um, you can – different colors uh, convey also um, different tones. For example, blue is in a very authoritative yet a friendly color to use, which is why the our, our police and the boys in blue wear blue uniforms. So – that's an example of where a color can be uh, of an important use as well. Um, you also might have um, your own branding as well. So uh, if you have your own colors and if this is particularly a lead gen, then it's nice to see how the book is visually tied with the rest of your platform. So it's really actually tied together and becomes becomes one. And so the, uh, there's probably an element of trust transference mm. that happens there as well. So that's important to consider. Okay. And that can be factored into the design as well. Yeah. And that, that does, there's probably a lot to talk about in terms of design <laughs> yeah. and we could spend forever talking about that, and especially with your background, Anthony, as a designer. But let's move forward. You, you were going to talk about, okay, so we've got the typesetting done, we've got the edited document done, we've got the PDF, the 
the, the digital version ready, the print version ready, how do we get it to the world and make sure lots of people see it? Okay. These days, um, I recommend using the, the new printing technology, Print On Demand. So it's probably something perhaps a few of your listeners have heard, but it's essentially rather than the old way of buying a whole bulk of stock of books up front and then trying to sell them, with Print On Demand, you're essentially – the book is actually uh, created once there's been a – uh, an actual purchase order being made. So uh, once the purchase order has been made, that little mouse runs out the back and says, hey, you know, print the book, bind the book, glue the book, package the book, and send it off. And that's print on demand. So the benefit is, is that there's no actual stock on hand. So the, the warehousing fees aren't there, which is what the, you know, a lot of the um, wholesale and distributors would have to usually pay for and publishers too. So obviously uh, that's not required anymore, um, and you don't have to do pay – and outlay that huge upfront cost that you would have to do, you know, five, ten years ago when self-publishing. So uh, the print-on-demand model makes it much more uh, efficient that way. So the next the next step is, is that there are some uh, printers that might be local to you, like in our own hometown, home country of Australia, that actually do print-on-demand. So they'll do digital printing and they'll do it within, in a very short time frame. Um, but they're not actually distributors as well. They're just printers. They're just digital printers. Um, so what print-on-demand I recommend is actually uh, going to those print-on-demand companies that are actually printing and distributing in the one. Okay, There's these companies that actually do both. They're one in the same. So there's the two most popular ones would be CreateSpace, which is owned by Amazon, and there's also Lightning Source as well, which is owned by Ingram. And Ingram's the world's largest book distributor. And so because the Ingram uh, owns Lightning Source, uh, it allows uh, publishers to be able to plug into their system to get uh, an international book print availability. So that's the way that uh, I recommend and help our clients set up, uh, whether they're a, an author that has done you know, two or three books beforehand or whether or not they're a new author. This is a great uh, option, and it it's really has been a, a blessing for, for independent authors these days, especially when they're just starting out building their brand. Um, and it's just great for efficiency. The, the outlay and barrier to entry financially is um, is far lower to the point where you're really just paying for the book production itself. So how we connect the book production, which is what we just talked about, to actually getting our book out there works like this. So let's just say we're using Lightning Source. Since we, we want to get everywhere, um, we want to both want to be available in our own country, want to be available to perhaps uh, to be ordered by stores and by libraries and online retailers like Amazon and Barnes & Noble. So Lightning Source can actually facilitate all of that distribution for you. So what we do is I recommend uh, people actually create their own publishing name. So, for example, as an author who doesn't have an actual um, uh, business of their own, they can just create something as simple as a uh, as a sole trader, which allows them to be a legal trading entity. So they can be a sole trader. They can actually register a publishing name. So they can decide on a publishing name that they want. They can come up with a bit of a short list. Uh, there's a few checks and balances you can do to make sure there's no other publishers um, trading under that same name. So once you've actually met all those requirements, you can go, great, this name's available. I'm going to go down to my uh, my registry shop, uh, whichever country that uh, your listeners happen to be in. Um, obviously, I, I know Australia and I know some of the US, but it's going to be different for depending where you live, of course. But basically speaking, uh, you go and register your business name so th- uh, so that you have it. Uh, I know here in Australia it's between you know thirty and seventy dollars, so it's it's really nothing. It's incredible. So once you do that, you want to and you have your business name. You want to then perhaps create a, a bank account for for your business name, so you can keep your personal and your um, your business publishing finances separate. Then um, what you want to buy is your ISBNs, and this is where um, this is an important step to do. Obviously before book production. So what I'm talking about now is just setting up an account for print on demand, print and distribution, and this happens before the book production because you need your print final files ready to go before they can be printed. So I'll continue the, the, the story here. So you get buy your ISBNs once you've got your publishing name, you buy your ISBNs. They are your, um, your book identification numbers. So they're essentially like your product numbers that uh, your barcodes 
get derived from. So every book has a has an ISBN number associated to them. So when you are actually uh, registered within the actual book system of the world, your particular book can be found based on this ISBN. So librarians and retailers and all use the ISBN. So it's important to get one. And it, it, how it has you be the um, the, the publisher of record as well. So you are the publisher. So your ISBNs, um, there are, in Australia, uh, we can get a block of 10 ISBNs, which can do 10 books, uh, say, for about 80 bucks. Uh, I think in the US, it's about 250 So we, we get off better in Australia for that. Um, so each book needs its own ISBN. And so, and we actually can just create free barcodes for you. You don't need to actually buy barcodes from the ISBN office, which is Bowker. So uh, Bowker link is uh, where you can buy your ISBNs. You can go to the website. We can probably leave these in the show notes if you wanted to, Riara. Um, you can go there and uh, you buy us your ISBNs. You can do it in, in just a few minutes. You buy your ISBNs using your publishing name, and each ISBN gets assigned to your book. Okay, so with your particular book, you'll have one ISBN for your print book. You'll have a separate ISBN for your ebook. Okay, because they're considered as two separate products. Okay, mm -hmm. so now once you've actually bought your ISBNs, you're now effectively a trading publisher now. So now that you've got your uh, your team, you know who you're going to have do your book, put it together. You've got your publishing name. You've got your your bank account and just done the necessary personal stuff that you need to do to set that up. It's going to be different for everyone. Uh, and you bought your ISBNs. Okay, you're now ready to set up your publishing account with lightning source so you are now it's, and this is an important distinction to make doing it this way you are the publisher on paper uh, as far as our lightning source concerned you are the publisher lightning source is just the printer and the distributor okay they're not the publisher okay so what you do is you're creating a, a an account with lightning source as a publisher a new publisher account it's free to set up Okay, they'll take about a, a day or two to review your, your account details and you once you've got your, your account set up, you're ready to go. And so at this point in time, uh, your book production process, oops, sorry, just bumped the mic. Your book production process is probably already being underway and at the end of um, your book production process, you'll have two PDF files, one for your cover, one for your interior, and you as a publisher now, as a person, can upload those two files to Lightning Source to your dashboard uh, do the necessary uh, submission data and, and forms and stuff so your book can go into the system. It goes through a review process. You order a print proof just to make sure the color looks right and the, the spine's in line and everything is it appears how you imagine it would. And then once you approve your proof, uh, Lightning Source then takes your book file, your book data, and then spits it out to all the thousands of retailers all around the world. And then you exist. You have a book that can uh, you, be bought. That's right. That's it. So your book's to be bought. You've probably got about a, usually about a week to 10-day turnaround for your book just to gradually get out into all the different retailers. So sometimes your cover will appear and then your title appears and the rest of the data sort of follows a day later. So it's important just to allow that time just to, for it to propagate across the world. Now, when you say it appears, it's not on shelves. It's just in catalogs where they can potentially that's, order it. That's right. That's an, it's an important to note that for online shelves, you'll appear, you'll start just appearing on all the different shelves. Um, hundreds of, um, of online bookstores as well. Um, as far as libraries go, you'll be appearing on their databases. So there's different library services here in Australia, like uh, James, um, James Bennett, who are plugged into uh, the Ngram catalog, and they can actually order your book in. So you'll appear on those databases that where they do all their ordering from. So you want to be able to appear there, and that's what going through Lightning Source does, it allows you to do, allows you to get on those databases. And that goes the same for book retailers as well. It doesn't mean you'll automatically pop up on the bookshelf out the front of the store on the, the new bestsellers table in a few weeks' time. That, that's an entirely different thing. But um, you'll be able to appear. So when they go to the computer, they can see the different books are available. Whoever is for that store uh, is actually doing the new purchase orders, they can actually see that your book is available to bring in, mm -hmm. which is what you want. You need to be available first before people okay. can buy you. So and obviously all the online platforms will be able to stock your book straight away because there's no cost to them. That's so right. So you can be in Amazon as, uh, right away in both Kindle and uh, physical ship version once yep, you're in version. yeah, once you're in Lightning Source because yep. Ingress will, will handle all that. So That's right. Okay. So as you said, there's a lot of you said a lot of companies' names here and different things. So okay. we'll, we'll definitely yeah. have to get you to send me all the URLs so we can put sure. them in the show notes so everyone knows exactly where to go for these things. But 
Um, we, we almost reached the hour point here, Anthony, and I know oh, okay. we could spend a stupid amount of time talking about how to actually get your book then popular, which is a marketing question, but you've covered the production question and filled the gaps between printing on demand, distribution, and actually being available to people around the world. So I think that hopefully has cleared everyone's head. In summary for marketing, uh, without going into the details, basically you do like what everyone does to promote a business. You would start picking your, your channels, whether that's getting publicity, maybe you're hiring a publicist or releasing press releases, trying to get yourself on TV or radio or in magazines and newspapers, and also all the online marketing things you can do from everything to um, obviously writing a blog, doing a podcast, uh, creating content for SEO purposes, um, it's a, it's a huge subject, online marketing, yeah, yeah. and, and but yeah. all those things are what people do then to make their book popular. Now, is the sort of plan with that strategy, uh, or maybe you can tell me what you tell your current clients, do you sort of say, listen, what we want you to do is, you know, your book's now available for sale, let's focus on the city you live in first and try and get it big there, or the country you live in. And then do you tell them to go, uh, you know, contact this publicist and, and start getting press coverage? Is that what you normally tell people yeah. to do? Yeah. If they're, if they're looking at getting some bricks and mortar sales, then which is what, what I think you're talking about more specifically here is uh, for, yeah, like a nonfiction book to, to rather – because you don't want to be doing the consignment thing. You want to make sure that your book is available for them to actually order. So, yeah, what you do is if you know you're going to be doing a, a bit – a big publicity spread and um, you want you can be doing that within your hometown first and doing that you want to make sure that you uh, your bookstores all have your books um, in stock you're doing a um, you're doing a, a press coverage you're doing a lot of marketing there's a lot of um, um, a lot of press coverage that is coming and marketing and whatnot and you can uh, hear locally perhaps in your hometown and you can contact those few bookstores um, that you have in your hometown and let them know that all this is happening and that they should have a few copies of your book. Um, and it's important that... Um, when you say contact, you, do you mean just rock up to the bookshop and say, you know, check out my book? Is that what you... <laughs> oh, no, you can actually contact the, the people who actually order the book. Just email them and call okay, them. Right. Yeah, and you can just do that. So um, you can have... Um, you know, have a, a list of the different bookstores that you want to hit. You might have, say, about 12. It depends how many there are because stores are closing all around us. So um, you might have, say, about 12, and you might just take an hour of a morning and just call them all up just to let them know, hey, doing press coverage in this particular town. Uh, make sure you have a few books of this in. Um, you might have a bit of a, um, a pitch about yourself and who you are and what it is that you do. And authors have found uh, great success with that. Mm -hmm. And your hometown is a great place to start because they love local authors and they love local authors that look credible have a great message, and they'll support them. So if your press coverage it works great, you get people into those stores because that's the important thing. You need to get people into those stores. So the booksellers and the bookstores go, oh, so people, oh, this is something that's out there into the public and people are talking about it, and people are actually coming in to buy it. Well, look at that. We just sold two or three of those copies of that particular book. Well, let's get some more of those in, okay? And so if you sell those, then that's how your book can remain in the store and selling. So um, what you can do is that once you've uh, essentially dominated your hometown, if you like, you can move to different towns and eventually nationwide in your country doing that. So this is something that a traditional publisher would normally do. They have set reps, sales reps that go into these different stores or get them on the phone and email them uh, these days and say, we have a huge catalog. We just want you to look at these few books, um, blah, blah, blah. We have a, a new author. He's doing a book tour sale. This is his book. Can you make sure you have so many in stock? Uh, and they would have their own arrangement. But that's essentially how it kind of how it works. And they would do that, say, nationwide if they know there's going to be huge press coverage. Mm -hmm. And so that press coverage or whatever online coverage is to drive people get it out in the face of the public and drive those people back to the stores now the thing is even if you're a traditional published author or if you're an independent published author you you are you suffer the same weight which is um bookstores are limited by its shelf space and it includes this traditionally published books and if they don't sell within say the first five weeks or so um and they don't sell at all they're yanked they're gone so 
if you're a traditionally published author, your book is now being sold via online if it's not being stocked in every single store. Mm -hmm. And you have to wait till your rights and your contract ends before you can then take control and try and do something else with it. Mm -hmm. So this is something that um, you know, a lot of the traditionally published all the um, publishers, they don't act, and distributors, they don't actually tell you this. They don't want to tell you this because they want to have your book as another product to their bottom line that they can potentially sell when they feel like it. So you you do face that same challenge. And a lot of people see, oh, it'd be great to have a book on that front store shelf, just on the front where all the rest of them will see. But that's paid real estate. Publishers pay thousands of dollars to have books on, on for a couple of weeks on particular shelves in the store. Like it's real estate. There's politics involved. Mm. And so obviously the independent publisher uh, can't, doesn't have that sort of money or that sort of that brand incredibly just yet to do that. Mm. But be, simply having your book available or at least for them to be able to order is your first step. And then make sure that you're, if they're going to stock your book, that you do the press coverage you say you're going to do and not just sort of bail out mm. because, you know, once they've sold those books, they're not going to want to hear from you again. So you've still got to hold your end of the bargain and go ahead and actually make sure that coverage is and trying to push all those people to those stores. And they'll be happy to, um, you know, to order your books uh, again. And if you're in the available in the system, then they can just order your books through Lightning Source. Mm. Lightning Source takes care of the fulfillment for you. And before they actually drop your funds every month into your dashboard, they'll just deduct the print price. So you don't even have to do that. And it's all done on auto, you know, autopilot for you, Okay, which it, is the beautiful thing. It, it sounds to me that Lightning Source – is the key in a lot of this. And like you said, bookstores are closing. If anything, maybe we shouldn't be telling people to spend too much time on bookstops going forward for the future. And, and online marketing is the best sort of uh, plan for a self-published author. You know, not to ignore bookshops because I think sure. there will always be a place for them and maybe just the, the biggest ones will survive and a few you know unique niche ones in neighborhoods. But Really, it sounds like the best way to do is drum up as much attention as you can, and then that will drive word of mouth, which will then push the bookshops to carry it as well. So it's like get yourself interviewed on as many – like the Tim Ferriss sort of launch plan. Yep. Lots of podcasts interviewing you. That's right. Lots of In coverage on all the websites. So everyone's talking about you once. So doing right. a launch formula like a Jeff Walker thing but for a book. For a book, yeah, that's right. And he goes and he does the saturation thing. So he's in everywhere he can possibly be within, say, a, t a two week time frame. So everywhere you go, it's like, oh my God, there he is again. There he is again. Okay, look, I have to check this book out. And it's usually those after those few times that uh, for those people that are, um, aren't his greatest fans that they see his message, him somewhere, wherever they are online or offline, and then finally sort of motivated enough and go and check out and see what all, in quotes, all the fuss is about yeah. simply because he's everywhere. Big publishers do the same thing. They have that huge saturation push up front. And if it doesn't work out for them, and <laughs> there's thousands and thousands of books every year that doesn't work out for them, um, then those they do that huge push, and that's why the book's – are pulled off and made way for another new book. Yeah, yeah. And so if that is going to happen regardless, wouldn't you want to actually be in control so you can take the next step or do your focusing online and, and, and whatnot rather than having your book stuck in contract for another couple of years? Mm. It, and it, the way things move these days and as we go into the future, things changing so quickly, you need to be able to be nimble. It sounds to me that obviously self-publishing resonates with me and being in charge of the whole process like you've been talking about. But it, the way I kind of see this is I've, I've always had a free report available as a blogger to build my newsletter, the Blog Profits Blueprint. Yep. And a book, which even could be a book version of the Blog Profits Blueprint, a bit bigger and you know more in it, could be my kind of uh, lead resource for other places, but you know, bookshops in the physical world, Kindle, exactly. Amazon, and also even in, in real life, I could say, go buy my book, which people, everyone understands, where not everyone understands, go opt into my newsletter to download my free report. That's, that's right. That's good for web savvy, but not so good for, you know, the, the, the that's right. New and, and, and there's a lot of people that buy from the book depository because they enjoy, enjoy their, um, their free shipping. Lots of people buy from Booktopia, which is one of Australia's on biggest online retailers. So if you're through in the Ingram, um, through like having printed with lightning source with an account with them, you'll appear on those stores too. Mm -hmm. So anyone that you talk to and you say, you can go and buy my book. Oh, great. Is it available from here? And, and it's not Amazon, which everyone one online knows about then you know you can say yeah no problem just go and buy it and they can do that your your ability your window to having it be accessible to all the other different people that don't spend a lot of time online is greatly uh you know increased 
that way. Okay. So your your ability to be discovered is just um, dramatically, you know, increased. Yeah, it sounds like in my my marketing brain, brain, it's it's another good marketing tool that happens to tag a really good credibility tool. Which actually, there's probably not much more you can do for your credibility in terms of a big boost than publishing a book. You know, getting on stage in front of a lot of people it does it too, but the book can go around the world by yep. itself without you needing to be there. So that's right. Okay, Anthony, we've been talking about this for a while. Um, I, I do want to be aware of the time here. Now, all of these sure. things we talked about, you have services around this. And I know you're also launching a training program at some point for people who want to sort of do it themselves and, and go into more detail for each of these different things. So yep. is it safe just to say to go to, to bookcovercafe.com? That's right. The, the... Yep. That's, that's where you can find us. That's where that's our hub for where we're helping um, authors uh, get out into the global marketplace with a book they can be proud of that actually you know sells and, and builds their brand. We have this, all the different services there. You can contact me one on one as well through the contact form. You'll be able to reach me as well. Okay, and everything we talked about, you either consult or provide for people, or can teach people how to do it from production, distribution, editing, uh, and all that marketing stuff we've been sort of touching That's on. That's right. Well. Yep, we help them with, with all of that as much uh, or as little hand-holding as they, they would like as well. I, I blog there too. Okay. Well, it's. I think you can tell the listener that Anthony knows a lot about this subject because <laughs> he sounds like he, he's done it a lot. I mean, having published 50 books f with four other people will give you a lot of insight and going through the process yourself as an illustrator of a book. So... Uh, there's a lot to know in this process, but I think uh, it, it sounds like it's worth going through it, like being a published author can really help you. So, uh, Anthony, thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Bookcovercafe.com, everyone, again, to check out Anthony. And uh, I look forward to working with you on my own book in maybe 12 months' time, depending on when you downloaded this podcast, my book will be out there. So uh, it'll be interesting to go through the process uh, myself. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Anthony. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. And for everyone listening in, you know where to go for more podcasts like this. You can go to entrepreneurs-journey.com or Google my name, which is Yaro, Y-A-R-O, and hit the podcast tab on my site where you will find lots more to download. And of course, please do subscribe through iTunes and uh, leave a review if you're listening in through that channel as well. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. And one more reminder, guys, if you are interested in taking part in my EJ Insider Interviews Club, membership is now open. We've got a great new series of interviews that's currently going to members only inside that club, as well as you get access to my entire back catalog of all my interviews I've ever published, including some private coaching interviews that were only released in my paid coaching programs. You also get action plans, which were handwritten by me, that help you to execute the leverage points that you learn from the new exclusive interviews you get each month. So it really is a concentrated and focused coaching style interviews club. You're going to get inspiration and you're going to get real techniques to apply to your online blogging or information marketing business. Go to www.ejinsider.com forward slash interviews and you can learn all about the EJ Insider program and sign up. My name is Yara Stark, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.